there are things called normal forms. There's a general topic for general um, uh, vector fields. And so there's this topic of normal forms. And the idea of normal forms is you take, and, and this is for general ODEs. You take an ODE and for now, let's just think of a time independent ODE and maybe this looks really complicated. So you do a transformation to a different set of variables Y and in Y, the dynamics for Y look simpler. So this should sound familiar from the stuff about you know, you transform, do a canonical transformation, but there's a, there's a method for general ODEs and it's called normal forms where uh, one approach is if F, this right-hand side can be written in, as a polynomial in the X variables. So if you could write this as say, there's some uh, term that's constant plus something that's first order in X, second order in X, and so on. You could do your change of variables such that you're able to uh, eliminate the second order terms. Which then uh, maybe it changes the third or order terms. So you do another change of variables to get rid of third or order terms and so on. Um, <clears throat> we will be talking about a method for doing this for Hamiltonian systems. Uh, in past versions of this course, I've actually gone over this more general ODE method, uh, but it can get pretty involved um, and we just don't have time for it. Uh, if you are interested, I could point you to, the, to some references. It might also get taught in another course. I know that uh, Dr. Abade taught nonlinear systems. She might have gone over normal forms. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, it'd be good if there's somewhere in Virginia Tech where you could get this. Um, so there's a more general theory of normal forms. Then there's the idea of Hamiltonian normal forms. And the Hamiltonian no, 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 normal form, the way it's different is uh, you're doing the change of variables, but not to simplify the vector field directly. Here, we're trying to trying to simplify the vector field for a general, right, the ODE. Simplify the vector field, which is the same as the ODE. For the Hamiltonian normal forms, because everything arises from the Hamiltonian function, what we're doing is simplifying the Hamiltonian function. So instead of having to simplify a vector, we are simplifying a scalar function. Um, so where you would originally have a Hamiltonian that's maybe complicated, you do a transformation to some new set of variables where the new Hamiltonian is simpler. And there are, um, I think there's a variety of different ways to do this. We'll approach this using a way called the, the Lee transformation method. And it finds, right, this transformation has to be a canonical transformation. Up here, for general things, it, you're just totally unconstrained, right? It's not like this is any particular transformation. Here, for Hamiltonian systems, we must have a canonical transformation. So we will use, we'll use the method of Lee transforms. or it's the Lee transformation. So let me talk about that. And it comes up at this point in the course because it does involve the Poisson bracket. So the Lee transformation method 
I'm finding a canonical transformation. Um, this is used to simplify the Hamiltonian. And let me give you some references. There is uh, the Sans Cerno, I think, and, and Calvo, chapter 12. Uh, also, I have a, I have a book and section 9.6 of that book. It's a book that grew out of my PhD thesis. So there's all these committee members on uh, listed for the book too. And I'll put that, it's a free book. It's just like a 330 page PDF. Uh, we made it open access. It was accepted by Springer, but then we just thought, eh, we're not going to make any money. You know, it'd be a hundred dollar book and I don't want to make you buy a hundred dollar book. So it's free. And we actually discuss this. Um, just some other terms that are used for this method, the Lee series method. Uh, it's also called the Lee transform method. I'd be hard pressed to know what the difference is between a transform and a transformation. I would guess I would think transform is a verb and transformation is a noun. But anyway, um, so some background terms. Uh, if you remember when, uh, maybe it was last week when we talked about a vector field and if we had a vector field generated by a Hamiltonian, say a Hamiltonian called G, then we use this term. So this is the vector field generated by the Hamiltonian function. G. And all this stuff with the Lee transform method, uh, I guess I should say it's, it's in the context of canonical Hamiltonian systems that I know. There might be a non-canonical version, but that means we're in the usual space of Q's and P's. So if you have a vector field generated by a Hamiltonian, then there's also the flow. Um, right, if we had a, let me, here's a little sketch of a vector field. That's a vector field. And if you had some initial condition um, at this point, Q and P, then you'd have a, that would take you to some other point under the flow. So I'm using notation that I've used before flow for time t under the vector field generated by the Hamiltonian g of q p. So that takes you to some new point when you view it as you're flowing over time. So here this phi thing is the flow map. The flow map of the vector field x Gee. Okay. And now instead of actually viewing this as a, like we're evolving something in time, uh, we're going to say, well, this new point is Q bar, P bar, and Q bar, P bar, which is, um, starting with Q and P and then just flowing for some time. We've talked about before how the flow map of a Hamiltonian vector field is a canonical transformation. So 
we could view this instead of uh, where we've like evolved the original Q and P in time, we could view Q bar and P bar as new variables. So we've done a canonical transformation from the old variables, Q, P to new variables, Q bar, P bar. And now there's some more that we have to do to build up to the point where we're going to do the um, the normal form approach. First, we let's look at what happens to a scalar function of the original variables, the old variables. So let Q, let uh, f, q, and p be some scalar function. just a scalar function of our phase space. Then what if we wanted to get f of q bar, p bar? So at the point after you've flowed for some time, that would be another way to write this is f of the flow under the Hamiltonian g for time t of q p. Another way to write this, a mathy sort of way is to use the composition. So we'd say we first we start with Q and P. We flow. It looks like I'm running a G. I'm trying to write a P. Phi, G, T, and we compose that with the scalar function. So this little circle thing is the composition. composition of the two functions. Right? We think of the map, the flow map as a function, and then the scalar uh, as a function. We could also look at how the derivative, take the derivative of f with time, And there's an expression um, that I'm going to be using. It's important enough that I'll, I'll star it. But we'll just, we're going to take the derivative of this composition, d by dt, f composed with that flow map. And it turns out that this equals the Poisson bracket of f with that Hamiltonian, g composed with the flow map. And so this is a result, um, this is, I guess the only place I could find it was in our book. So this is equation 9.6.5 of my book. All right, now we're gonna, we're going to define, well, capital F T as this composition of little f with the flow map. And then we'll tailor, we'll do a Taylor series expansion. About uh, the initial time about t equals zero. So f t, this is just the usual Taylor series expansion for a function capital F of one variable. f t is f evaluated at zero plus uh, f prime, right? f is just a function of one variable. So f prime is df dt. f prime zero times t plus one over two factorial f double prime zero t squared, you know, plus well, what's the nth term look like? One over n factorial 
uh, the nth derivative of n evaluated at zero t to the n that just goes on and on okay well from this starred equation up here f zero is uh, f zero composed with flowing uh, for a time t equals zero. If you flow for no time, that's just the identity. So this thing becomes the identity. So this is just little f zero. Uh, I guess we haven't used equation star yet. Equation star. Uh, so that's just that part. From equation star, we can get the derivatives of f. So f prime at zero. So that's the derivative of capital F. Um, this is derivative of f composed with the flow map, but all evaluated at time zero. That equals the Poisson bracket of f with g evaluated at time t equals zero, composed with the flow map at time t equals zero, which is again, the identity. So this is just f plus on bracket with g evaluated at time zero. That's what the subscript O means. We can get f double prime and we'll get f g with g all evaluated at time zero composed with the flow map at time t equals zero so that's the identity again and we just got these embedded poisson brackets evaluated at zero and so that just goes on and on you could do this to whatever order you want then you can use G, the generator of the Hamiltonian flow, uh, which is a canonical transformation to go from quote time T equals zero to T equals one. But then we'll pick G to create a canonical transformation that transforms little f uh, to big F in a way that we want, usually in a way that makes it simpler. We want capital F to be simpler than the initial lowercase f. Um, let me write some of the formulas. We can use G generator of the Hamiltonian flow. which uh, is a canonical transformation to go from t equals zero to t equals one. I'm writing it in quotes because this isn't really time. It doesn't really have to be time. It's just some dummy variable that helps us achieve what we want, which is to uh, do a transformation. So F at one, we're just putting in like, why did you choose T equals one? This one is a nice convenient number. Uh, capital F evaluated at one is F zero plus Poisson bracket of F with G at zero plus one over two factorial Poisson bracket of F G, G, at zero, and so on. And just like we talked about last time with the uh, Poisson bracket uh, expansion, this this may truncate. If at some point this the this embedded Poisson bracket thing equals zero, then all uh, higher terms must also equal zero. 
So this is something that we will use. So we can pick G. We will pick that this kind of dummy Hamiltonian thing. It's a, it's a dummy because it's not really a Hamiltonian time. We're just using this mathematical structure of Hamiltonian systems. We're going to pick a function G to create a canonical transformation, which uh, makes uh, F into, or little f into big F in a way that makes it, usually we want it to be functionally simpler. Like maybe if f, if little f was a polynomial of order n, then maybe big F could be a polynomial of order n minus k. So we've cut off some terms. Um, okay, so this is called the Lee transform or Lee series approach. Or Lee transformation. This is an approach to constructing a canonical transformation that, and this is just typically, you could use it to do anything, but typically it's used to simplify a function. What's the main function that we might want to simplify? We might want to simplify a Hamiltonian function, the actual Hamiltonian that describes the dynamics for our system. So, so in particular, F might be the Hamiltonian of the dynamics for our system. And we want to simplify it. So in general, what I'm talking about here, it, this falls in the category of when you can't do the Hamilton-Jacobi equation because it's too hard or something, which it is. It's usually pretty hard, unless uh, it's separable, which that homework assignment had a separable Hamiltonian. Um, what's a systematic way and kind of rational way to find a canonical transformation? This is, this is one approach. It has its limitations. It usually only works for polynomial Hamiltonians. Um, but this, this is a systematic approach. So uh, we might want to, so F could be the Hamiltonian of the dynamics. Um, for example, what are we doing here? We want to construct a canonical transformation from the original to some new set, Q bar, P bar, to get H to go to something uh, simpler, H bar. It's simpler in the Q bar, P bar variables. Okay. Um, and I actually won't call this bar. Well, I don't know. Looks like I call it hat later on. So um, if you want, this is our little F and then this is our big F. So from that formula up above, so this is an application. The general thing that I was talking about is you want to simplify a function. Well, What's the main function we might care about? The Hamiltonian function, the one that relates to the dy dynamics. So H hat uh, is the original H plus H plus on bracket with G 
and I'm going to drop the little subscript zero. And then this is plus one half Poisson bracket of H with G, G, and so on. This is uh, especially useful um, for writing the Hamiltonian function about an equilibrium point. I mean, what does you might, what does that mean? About an equilibrium point. Um, that means variables so that um, I don't know why this says I've stopped sharing my screen. My internet connection is unstable. Start broadcasting again. Okay. It says I'm recording for doing something. There we go. Okay. Yay. So if you have your Hamiltonian written about an equilibrium point, um, uh, then the Hamiltonian usually has the form of a polynomial. What do I mean? So the original Hamiltonian, the original Hamiltonian shifted so that the origin is at the equi equilibrium point. You'll have H um, and that will decompose the Hamiltonian into terms. If there were a constant term, that would not be relevant. Um, there would not be a linear term in general because we're at an equilibrium point. So the first term is going to be quadratic. So I'll write H sub two. So this is the order of the polynomial of, of those terms. So these are quadratic terms. These are quadratic terms in Q and P. And the quadratic terms are what leads to the linearized dynamics, the linear part of the ODEs. And then we would have cubic terms. And I think you see where this is going plus H4. These are the quartic terms. And so the cubic terms, right? But when it, you take the Hamiltonian uh, canonical equations, it's partial H, partial Q, or partial H, partial P, you uh, reduce one of the, um, uh, the reduces one order. So cubic terms correspond to quadratic terms of the ODE. Quartic terms would become cubic terms of the ODE and so on. And you could do this, I don't know, I've seen people uh, write up to 35th order. Or you could, I mean, this is kind of like, it's a the Taylor series expansion of the 
near an equilibrium point. So you could go to whatever order you want. Um, okay, what about the transformed Hamiltonian? The transformed Hamiltonian will have h hat 2. It'll also have quadratic terms plus cubic terms plus quartic terms and so on. But if our goal is to simplify the Hamiltonian so that in the new variables, the Hamiltonian looks nicer, we can pick a canonical transformation. So that is pick G such that, um, let's say the, the cubic terms in the new variables equals zero. So that H is just H two plus H four and so on. Um, you might say, well, why not just eliminate the quadratic terms? Um, you can't eliminate the quadratic terms. It'd be like trying to eliminate the linear part of the ODs. You, you just can't, can't get rid of the lowest order ones. There's some rationalization for that. I don't know it off the top of my head. But then you pick, maybe you're like, oh, I, I wanna just get rid of all the higher order terms. I only want in, in my, new, my new Hamiltonian to just be quadratic, okay. Then you pick another G such that the transformation is now, uh, such that H4 equals zero. H is just H2 plus, well, whatever the next highest order is, H5, and so on. You could keep doing um, these transformations so that you push off terms to just higher and higher order. Higher and higher order means they're less and less significant. And then all you're left with is your, um, your linearized dy dynamics in some sense, plus a bunch of higher order things. So this is a strategy. We can, we can try it out. So let's let uh, G, let's start out with a G that's cubic. So I'll call it G sub three. Then um, H2, will the H2, H2 hat will just be H2. H3 equals, and so what am I doing? I am, I'm trying to apply this formula. H3 by the formula up above is going to be, the new H3 is going to be H3 from the old system plus H2 G3. Um, the Poisson bracket of something, uh, this H2 and G3, that this Poisson bracket is gonna give us something that's cubic because you lose two derivatives. If you remember the formula for the Poisson bracket, it had two partial derivatives multiplied by each other, which means if you have a polynomial, you lose one order in, in each. Um, what would H4 be? H4. So the fourth order terms of the new Hamiltonian would be the old fourth order terms plus everything that would contribute fourth order terms. H3, G3, plus one half H2, G3, G3. And this could go on, say H, N. Uh, well, let's not do that. I don't want to write out the whole thing. But these are, this is cubic. So we could pick G3 such that uh, 
H two G three. If we want the new H three to be zero, like we said right here, then we could pick this Poisson bracket to exactly cancel out H three. So we could pick G three such that this will equal negative H three. Um, and just so it, you have an idea of what these terms are, um, I've just sort of set up above, oh, you know, second order or third order or whatever. H, uh, K, and Q and P is equal to some sum over, uh, I can't do this for general and de degree of freedom. Let me just say for uh, for two degrees of freedom. So for two degrees of freedom, we've got Q1, Q2, P1, P2. All right, then this will look like there'll be these terms with coefficient H, I1, I2, J1, J2, multiplying, uh, uh, right, these polynomials. So this is Q1 raised to the I1 power, Q2 raised to the I2 power, P1 raised to the J1 power, P2 raised to the J2 power. So this is a, uh, this is a coefficient. This sum is over all of the variable, uh, all of these indices, I1, I2, J1, J2, but for this to be HK, the sum of I1, I2, J1, J2 equals K. So this is a K, uh, this is a homogeneous polynomial of order K. homogeneous and I1, I2, J1, J2, all of those are uh, natural numbers. I, I think the whole numbers so we could allow for the case of zero. Yeah, they're whole numbers. They're integers, okay, integers. All right, that's my fancy integer symbol. Uh, this is abstract and weird. Let's try it on at least a, are we even gonna try it? Maybe, oh, maybe I leave that as a homework. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, okay, I'll leave it as a homework. Um, For homework, uh, try on a one degree of freedom system. I'll leave it as one of the optional ones, not one you have to do. So let's say you have a Hamiltonian. It's just a function of Q1 and P1. You've got the quadratic part we can write like that. It looks, I mean, it, it is a simple harmonic oscillator, uh, but let's throw in this weird cubic term that just ruins everything. So now this is H2, that's the part that's uh, second order. Here's a part that's third order. And then H uh, K greater than or equal to or is just zero. There's just no higher order terms. So find a canonical transformation that eliminates the cubic term. Which means you'll do some change of variables on your system. Um, it'll be a nonlinear change of variables. It's a canonical transformation that in these new coordinates, this cubic term magically goes away. 
and you can you can do that. This is the Hamiltonian normal form method. Basically finding a canonical transformation to simplify the Hamiltonian. The nice thing about it, it's computationally, like people have coded up uh, ways to do this. Um, there's a group in Spain that has done a lot of work on designing algorithms to do this automatically so that you could, you give it a Hamiltonian and uh, it will try to uh, find a generating Hamiltonian that gets rid of the terms you don't want. Um, so that it could be all coded up. Um, I think this simple example here, this one degree of freedom system is probably the simplest one that you would even care to do by hand. So uh, usually this is done um, with software, but it helps simplify a Hamiltonian system uh, so that it's more easy to analyze. If you have something that's got a zillion terms, it could be hard to see what that is. But if you simplify it, and you're able to see, okay, what category of Hamiltonian is this? Is it topologically equivalent to something else that I've studied and I know about? Um, and this is so that finding transformations that simplify the Hamiltonian is the approach when you have a Hamiltonian system. If you don't have a Hamiltonian, if you just have some ODE, you don't know what special structure it might have. Like I said, there is a more general method uh, that works for any vector field it's then it's called the, the normal form method. Um, and it's kind of cool. It's almost as if there's a lot of mathematics related to ODEs grew out of mechanics. So some stuff that was started for Hamiltonians, people then generalized it and said, oh, we could, we're gonna try to do this approach, but for more general things. I, and uh, that's good because the world isn't just Hamiltonian. All right, it is 4.30 and I'm going to start a different topic. And that is infinite dimensional Hamiltonian systems. And if you want a reference, I will provide some. Uh, the main one that I know about is a book called Introduction to Mechanics and Symmetry. It is not an introduction. <laughs> it is very hard. Uh, by Marsden and Ratio. Uh, chapters one and three. So I'll put the, uh, I'll provide that. Um, the reason this shows up here is because it's the Poisson bracket that uh, kind of holds everything together. As long as you can write the evolution of a system in terms of a Poisson bracket, then it is a Hamiltonian system. Um, so all of, I, I think this is true, what I'm going to write, all mechanical systems with uh, some kind of continua, a continuous medium can be written as Hamiltonian systems. So this means fluids, solids, even space and time in terms of quantum mechanics. If I do one of my Venn diagrams, I think I've shown this before, there's like non-canonical Hamiltonian systems is a giant category. And then there's this little piece that's canonical Hamiltonian systems. 
And part of the non-canonical Hamiltonian systems would be like uh, infinite, infinite dimensional systems. So PDEs, uh, there's also quantum mechanics. Um, so for infinite dimensional Hamiltonian systems, the governing equations are PDEs instead of ODEs. Uh, like, like what? Well, like Maxwell's equations for how the electric and magnetic field changes in space, time. Uh, Hand and Finch has this kind of an interesting little and where they talk about a uh, it kind of to show you the transition from finite dimensional to infinite dimensional, they look at masses connected by springs. Maybe we're measuring uh, the displacement of each spring or each mass. And this just goes on and on. There's like a zillion of them, maybe attaching between two walls. Um, if you let, there's QN, if you let N go to infinity, then this system of masses and springs, which should be just a discrete mass system, um, becomes, it goes from being a large set of ODEs to in the infinite limit, it can be described as a PDE. And it's the PDE for a string, dynamics of a string. And that's illustrated in section 9.7 of Hand and Finch. Uh, but right, other things that are continua, plasma, ideal fluids, elasticity, you can write them in terms of a Hamiltonian. How is it? It all comes down to they're, they're not going to be canonical. They're definitely going to be non-canonical Hamiltonian systems, which means you, you need to make a choice of a Poisson bracket, which means you pick some Poisson bracket, uh, an operation that obeys all of those properties of a Poisson bracket. And if the dynamics then end up looking like that governing equation for all Hamiltonian systems, then you say, oh, uh, I have a Hamiltonian system. The nice thing is that then the PDE inherits I'm going to use that loosely, inherits all of the, the beautiful Hamiltonian structure. And then things happen in infinite dimensions. You could have. So uh, I. Uh, Yes. Um, could you have an um, a canonical infinite dimensional Hamiltonian system, like if you had an infinite number of gravitationally interacting particles or something? Yeah. In fact, that example of the the masses connected by springs, you could make that infinite dimensional um, and discrete. You'd have an infinite set of ODEs. It's just that it looks nicer if you take that limit it looks like a pde so then you may as well just work with the pde 
But yeah, you could have infinite ODEs. I see. Okay. Um, and when you here's a, a, a nice thing when you do have a PDE that's Hamiltonian, um, like as often happens if you have a PDE, sometimes you'll find certain limits where you can consider an ODE. Like if you have a PDE for a wave equation, maybe you look at, you assume a certain form of the wave and then you get ODEs for how the wave evolves. So if you do have a PDE that describes your system, then any finite dimensional approximations also inherit the Hamiltonian structure. So that might be worth saying um, finite Finite dimensional approximations inherit the Hamiltonian structure. There's an example that I'll focus on, and I'll probably just introduce it here. but it's the sh it's a, a version of the shallow water e equations. I think if you say shallow water equations, that's not an unambiguous like thing. <laughs> it's kind of a category. Uh, and there's a certain one that I'll look at. But this, as the name would imply, describes shallow water and in particular it gets used to describe the natural phenomenon of tsunamis these equations are called uh, Cor de Veig There's, it's two people's names and de Vries but then I usually just write it as KDB. And this is the reference here. This is from um, Marsden and Ratio. I think it's in there, section 3.2. Their section 3.2 is immense, but even has a subsection C. Um, yeah. The tsunamis, are in this case are a soliton solution. And I, I'm no expert in solitons, but solitons as I know are waves that uh, um, even though there's damping, the wave does not disperse. It just, it maintains its, its structure as it moves along which can be dangerous. That's why tsunamis are, are dangerous. So if, the, if there's an earthquake, you get uh, some immediate trigger of a wave and uh, that wave goes along without flattening and dissipating out. It keeps its shape. And that's why it um, can hit the coast and go very far inland. But I won't, we, we're not really gonna talk a lot about tsunamis. Let me just set up what the, the shallow water equations are. So our, we're looking at this infinite dimensional space uh, of just a scalar u as a function of x and t and this is the displacement of the water surface from equilibrium. Maybe I should sketch something. Here's, uh, here's space. And this U is the displacement. And blue is a nice color for water, so let's show that. So this is, I'm showing U of X and T at uh, time T is fixed. Because right? in general, this thing will be evolving. So U, will be at each point, it's giving the displacement of the water surface from some equilibrium. Um, and maybe you want to think of the, uh, uh, the ocean surface. 
So U is the displacement. I guess we could say vertical. Yeah. Vertical displacement of the water surface from equilibrium. So if the water was not disturbed, right, it'd be along this kind of red dashed line, it'd be along the U equals zero surface. And to be physical, uh, we require that, uh, right, that X is this infinite dimensional, it's the, the real line. So we require that the displacement goes to zero, the water surface is kind of at equilibrium at the ends, so at x goes to plus or minus infinity. And all of its derivatives go to zero. So there's just, there's nothing happening as you go, as you approach infinity. The equations um, are, and these are non-dimensional. So nice, there's this confusing number six that uh, lead to headaches. But if you rescale the equations appropriately, you get, you get this. So it's a nice, elegant looking PDE. X is real. Uh, T is real. So this is a, this is a PDE for you. So it's a PDE that describes how U evolves in space and time. So because the space is um, here, the, the real line X, so X uh, is infinite dimensional. That's why this is a uh, infinite dimensional. You know, one of the key things, or maybe the key thing about this PDE is it admits soliton solutions. And I, I honestly couldn't tell you, maybe I'll get a slide next time to show uh, the meaning of these different terms and why is there a number six. Um, the first one just says, okay, this is how this thing changes in time. And the second one looks like it's kind of from the Navier-Stokes equation. There's that term in Navier-Stokes, which is velocity times gradient of velocity. Well, there it is, the weird number six. And then uh, don't know what that is. But a soliton would be a solution where you've got some it's some shape that propagates without changing. So it doesn't shallow out, it doesn't steepen, it just propagates along. So it's a shape that propagates without changing. And you can write this system Uh, can be written as a Hamiltonian system. With, um, and I, I will end here, the appropriate choice of, first of all, one, a Poisson bracket, and then two, the governing Hamiltonian function. 
which I think interestingly is not the kinetic energy. I think it's something else. So I will, I'll stop there and we'll continue with that next time. Um, there's also a homework problem about this system. And what will we eventually get to? Uh, I think next time we will get to parametric resonance. So it's, it's uh, much more kind of down to earth dynamics-y stuff about like if you have a pendulum and you excite it, what will, what kind of dynamics can happen? So we'll be talking about resonance and that'll lead to some other things that I think are much easier to grasp than how the shallow water equations are Hamiltonian. But you know that it's good to be exposed to all these things. <laughs>